Well, I got five after. We'll jump in. Um, for those of you, if you're new, uh, reading Growing Up Together, we are through chapter. We'll cover five and six tonight. Uh, just a quick review what we covered one and two are basically just the need for discipleship and how discipleship is lacking in so many churches and kind of give a vision for disciple making. Uh, then week two, we looked at chapters three and four, giving a blueprint of a discipleship group, D group. And then chapter four was really just on the importance of godliness. And then the rest of the book, six to 10. So we're in week three of five. And the rest of the book, we're looking at this acronym closer, I'm looking at the table of contents now. So we'll do uh, closer, CLO, SER, communicate, learn, obey, store, evangelize, renew. And so today we'll hit communicate and learn. So prayer and word, basically. And then we'll look at obedience. We'll look at scripture memorization. We'll look at evangelism and then an approach to reading the word. So these are kind of general chapters uh, just to help us, you know, again, be a disciple before we go to make disciples, but also things that we do in discipleship group. So so chapter five, uh, communicate, knocking on heaven's door. In here, they ask from one to 10, how would you rate your prayer life? Anyone, anyone more than a six? If you did, you wouldn't want to say, right? I think um, like in rating it, are we talking about is it referring as a whole or like, cause like you can spend a certain amount of time in prayer and still not be deep in prayer, or you can just go deep in prayer and time is irrelevant, you know, because you're, you're deep and it doesn't matter what, how much time you're spending in it. But so it's like, there are days for myself, there are days when, um, I'm not so, it's not so deep. I mean, I'll just confess that it's not so deep, but then there are some days that I can't push myself away from this table because it's so good. It's so good. And I'm snotting all over the place and it's just deep. And I feel like I'm really sitting right here with the Lord. But, but again, like I said, some days it's like almost feels like a drive by sometimes. And I'm just talking about my, designated time that I spend with the Lord in the mornings, not, not prayer time, like throughout the day. I'm just talking about that designated morning time. Yeah. Yeah. Something I feel like every believer at every stage uh, feels like we can always be improving. So it's good. It's good to talk about it. Good to read about it. Good to be prodded, spurred. I appreciate that he talks about the fact, you know, prayer is to commune with God. Prayer is to praise God. Prayer is to ask God. But he talks about how in the first couple of pages that we are changed through prayer. And so prayer is part of our own transformation. And some of you probably experienced that. One of the, one of the ways I've experienced this most is if there's someone that's against me, uh, in any way to begin to pray for them and it just changes my posture you know if someone say critical of whatever you name it begin to pray just pray for them and my heart then will be turned from an adversarial posture to a place of empathy and compassion so as we pray our desires are changed we're changed priorities changed our way of thinking's changed so that's really nice, right? That God didn't have to do that. We could just pray and not be affected by it. But in God's kindness, as we pray, we ourselves are shaped. So I thought it was a good place to start like he did there, just talking about the importance of prayer and, again, how we change through it. And he talks about, he uses the, uses the Lord and uses the Lord's Prayer quite a bit in this chapter. It talks about, you know, we can talk about prayer. We can read chapters on prayer. We, we should. I think we should read about prayer regularly. The elders are currently reading a book called Prayer. Uh, and we'll do that sort of thing regularly. But at the end of the day, he says, if you got your book, it's on page 68. He says, prayer is not learned in a classroom. The most crucial words in this crash course, talking about the Lord's Prayer, are the first three, when you pray. 
We don't learn how to pray by going to prayer conferences. We don't learn how to pray by reading books on the subject. There's only one way to cultivate an intimate, effective prayer life. Pray, pray, pray. Even though you may study foreign language, the only way to learn it thoroughly is to speak it. Prayer is similar. You learn it by doing. Prayer is learned experientially. Jesus, through his silence, is saying, listen, prayer is not about filling your mind with knowledge on ways to pray. Prayer is about doing it, so start praying. Andrew Murray, speaking of the practice of prayer in his book, With Christ in the School of Prayer, commented, reading a book about prayer, listening to lectures and talking about it is good, but it won't teach you to pray. You get nothing without exercise, without practice. I might listen for a year to a professor of music playing the most beautiful music, but that won't teach me to play an instrument. A, power, a powerful prayer life is developed through the practice of actually praying. That's a good word, you know. We feel like we're not good prayers. We just need to do it. Uh, you really just practice and begin and jump in. Let's look at let's look at Luke 11. He uses Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. Let's look at it together. The bulk of this chapter, he really is just unpacking the Lord's Prayer. So, or this section of Scripture. Luke 11. Let's read 1 to 13. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a because he is his friend, yet because of his impotence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asked for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil... There we have Jesus' uh, opinion of humanity. If you then who are evil <laughs> know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And Galilee from this section brings out the fact that prayer is personal. We are children of the Father. We address him as Father. Uh, it's relational. He calls us friend in this uh, analogy that Jesus teaches on. And then it's intimate. And he, again, he unpacks, and won't spend a lot of time on it, but just kind of goes through and unpacks this, uh, this prayer. And he says the Lord's Prayer is a skeleton. It's a springboard. You know, we in the Baptist church often, I don't think enough, uh, recite the Lord's Prayer. I think we need to be doing it more than we, uh, than we do uh, in church and in home. But I think he's right that at the end of the day, it is a skeleton and a springboard. It's not just rote words, but it is a pattern. He's teaching us how to pray. And he says that on 71. Uh, and he, and he kind of lays out different ways that we see in terms of a skeleton. Well, we have praise. We have purpose. We're asking for his will to be done. We have, we're asking for provision, uh, for pardon, for protection, and then praise once again. So using that as a model, it's really important that he starts asking God's name to be honored, right? It starts with a God-centered prayer. Hallowed be your name. May your name be holy. May your name be honored. He uses this illustration on 72 of a rock pile. How big is your rock pile? And the idea is, is we, we pray, hopefully, often every day, but how often do we stop and uh, just recount God's goodness in our lives and have specific prayer requests and then go and see in different ways that he's answered them? And I'll confess, we're really bad at this. Alicia and I have had uh, lots of ideas in this regard. In fact, we've got this jar on our wall by our dinner table 
and the idea was just, a, you know, making a pile. We didn't, this was new, but the same idea, having a pile of rocks of God's faithfulness. We've done another thing. I can't remember. Oh, that's what it was. It was little uh, wood chips, right? Little pieces of wood. We we're going to do the same thing and fill up the jar. And man, both of them have like one each, <laughs> like five years. We're just not good at keeping track. But it's a good idea, and he's going to say use a journal. I personally am not a big fan of a prayer journal that he mentions. So I'd say if that works for you, do it. If not, don't worry about it. But the idea of just keeping track with what God has done and how he has answered prayers, I think we could all stop and reflect the last three or four or five years at the kindness of the Lord in uh, answering prayer. So building a pile of rocks as just a, a way of thankfulness for his faithfulness. And then he walks through six components of prayer. So these are starting on page 74. And says we need to be praying persistently. And we see that in the teaching of Jesus. Not giving up, continuing to ask. From Luke 11. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Being persistent, holding on, pressing on. Uh, not giving up. So pray persistently. Pray privately, and he uses that, Jesus' as an example, he uses Matthew 6, and that's where we talked about the importance of planning, and uh, I'm just a big believer in plan. I just, he says himself here, poor praying is a result of poor planning. I think if we don't have, I, I think we ought to have a time, a place, uh, and a plan on how to pray, and I'm even, I'll have lists, and I'll switch them up, and I'll have prayer books. I, just, I person, my personality, I need to switch it up every three, four, five months but making it a part of your schedule for that formal aspect of actually, you know, spending some time in prayer, not to mention praying throughout the day, but so private prayer, uh, praying publicly, praying with people, praying in groups. That'd be with the D group for this book. Praying precisely is the fourth one. And here I was encouraged. He just talks about, just asking and praying for specific people to be saved. And this is the beauty of an AD group. One of the things you want to do in a D group is talk about evangelism and talk about people you either are sharing the gospel with or you want to. And so as you, every time you meet, talk about praying for this person or that person, I think it just adds uh, urgency. It brings accountability. And, and we're asking God to save people, right? I often ask the question that, that I was asked, if God answered every one of your prayers for the last month, what would happen? If today God answered every single one of your prayers for the last 30 days, who would be saved? Anybody? And so praying specifically and praying for God to save, man. Asking big. I think we just don't ask big enough often enough. So, And that's number five, praying confidently, praying in faith, and expecting God to move. I mean, do we really do we really believe that God is the God of the universe who's able to answer prayer? And so praying persistently and praying in faith. And then six, praying constantly throughout the day. First Thessalonians 5 17, pray without ceasing. And so this is this idea of just constantly communing with the Lord. You know, as we're growing in spiritual maturity, the Lord is always on our mind. We're not Christians for an hour a week, we're Christians all the time. And so we're wanting to please him and we're praying to him regularly throughout the day. So do what works. You know, I've got a pastor friend that he'll set an alarm for like 10 and two so that it dings. Okay. I'm going to stop what I'm doing and pray. Any thoughts on this six components before we keep going? Any of any of you that are reading, which one was most helpful, challenging? On page 78, where he's talking about the seven up, um, like to, the challenge of the seven up to wake up every morning for the next seven days for seven minutes. As soon as you wake up, you know, just pray for seven minutes and see where that takes you. And, and um, you have to cultivate those habits, I think. And it just reminded me of, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Spurgeon says, um, woe to the one who encounters man before he encounters God. 
that just, that's helped me so much and sitting down at this table, you know, because it's true. Because if you walk out the door and you haven't spent that time with the Lord, it will smack you in the face. It's just, it's hard to live without that for me now. I've cultivated that habit and I, I don't want to start my day without it. Yeah. No, the members guide has been helpful praying through that, looking at people's faces, even though I don't know who they are, except for on a piece of paper. But um, so I get to where if I skip a day, I feel bad for that page of people <laughs> that I've missed paying for. I was supposed to go back. But um, so that's been helpful for me to to pray for others and not just myself. And I, I like, I enjoy praying for the unreached people groups included in that. And so I'd even like to see more um, types of groups in Abilene that we could be praying for in our community or other churches that we partner with, stuff like that would be good too. Yeah, that's good. Does anyone have any testimonies of the Lord answering a long-term persistent prayer request of yours? Blake, I'll chime in for a second. I, uh, I don't have one specifically right off the bat for myself, um, but I will tell you, uh, you're asking about this list and praying publicly. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, I would put that in a category of our home with our family and with your children to model that for your children as well. Um, and what was amazing to me is if you want to see how well the Lord can work through prayer, um, watch your children pray and see what they ask for and see how God honors that in those answered prayers. And I can tell you, it is so amazing to see uh, Nathaniel pray and watch God answer his prayers. And, and it even challenges my own faith because he's praying with a childlike faith and, and God just honors that. And, uh, I remember in Abilene, Texas, uh, where he has never seen snow before and, and a young child just praying for snow. And I know for us, that was insignificant to, to worry about snow, but this boy wanted to do it. Even today, uh, you know, five years, four years later, he knows that God answers prayers. And when we talk about prayer, he says, God answers my prayer. Remember, he rem remember he answered my prayer when I prayed for snow in Abilene, Texas, it came. And that faith has just carried through through that one answered prayer. Well, yeah. I think most of us in this study can attest to long-term prayer for a, for a pastor for our church. We saw mm -hmm. God work in a lot of ways uh, in a lot of families um, through all of that. So there's that. Yeah. Like when you gave us one person to be praying for, I don't know if it was in a year, just for that year, I don't remember anyway. My one person was a house of faith mom that actually did come to know the Lord and she ended up marrying her boyfriend um, hmm. so they could make things right. And they're attending a church. And um, and I told her, I was like, you're my one. Like I was able to tell her <laughs> that, you know, I was praying for her. And so that meant a lot. And so I think just, you know, don't um, think those things are insignificant. Just praying for that one person. So. Yeah, amen. That's awesome. I've got one, Blake. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when I left to go to school um, at, to tech, um, I had been living for uh, two years. Uh, our parents had passed away and we had had um, uh, foster parents for the last year. And that situation was uh, not going well for my sister. 
And so I was asked, um, or I was told that I could not come home anymore um, from school and um, that I would have to get all of my things out and could no longer live there. It was because my sister behaved so poorly after I would come home for a weekend. Anyway, um, I had had a very lonely summer. I felt very detached from all of my friends that I had been so in such a strong relationship in church. Um, anyway, I began to pray that God would just give me a home of my own. Uh, I just felt like I just needed a home where I belonged. And even if it was just for me, that would be um, good. I wasn't praying for a husband or anything like that. I just wanted a home of my own. And um, a couple of months later, God sent me John. And uh, we got engaged a month and two days after our first date. <laughs> and we got married seven months later. and. That has almost been 50 years ago. So um, that was a prayer that I always look back on that God answered, even when I wasn't praying specifically for a husband. Uh, we have certainly had a, I have certainly had a home of my own. Yeah, that's awesome. It worked for us, but we're not recommending other people's kids date for two months and get engaged, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. can you hear me yes sir so i i prayed whenever i was uh young in my walk i prayed every day for a mentor for a year and i got into accountability group and i'm still meet with uh one of the guys 20 years later hmm. that's awesome And nothing better than those 20 year, 20 year brothers and sisters, man. I was talking with, I don't remember, it might have been Cody. I was telling somebody I've got a couple. No, it's not Cooper, Cooper Osborne. Uh, a couple of my buddies uh, been walking with 18 years, which is crazy to think about. Time flies, but. Well, if you don't have someone you're praying, an unbeliever you're praying for regularly, let me challenge you to find one. I mean, you could probably stop and think right now of someone uh, that you know that is an unbeliever and uh, begin to pray for them. Pray for them every day. God would save them. Be persistent about it. He talks, uh, and this is towards the end of the chapter, about the importance of praying scripture. Some of you have heard us talk about praying scripture or praying the Psalms. Donald Whitney's got a book called Praying the Psalms. It's it's a really helpful way to stay. For me, it keeps me on track. My mind doesn't wander as I'm working through a Psalm. Um, and Whitney's really helpful in, in uh, basically teaching us how there's an app called Five Psalms and there's a Psalm of the day, you know, every day, so you can vary it up. But the idea, and you can do it with any scripture, the idea is basically turning God's word into a prayer. And so most of us pray about the same things most every day, right? We're gonna pray for uh, our walk. We're gonna pray for maybe hopefully an unbeliever. We're gonna probably pray for our family. We're probably gonna pray for something to do with our job. Um, maybe something to do with health. You know, there's six, seven things that we're praying for our church. We're praying for uh, regularly. And the Psalms help us to vary those, those prayers. But again, any, any passage of scripture would work. Praying scripture. He also mentioned acts. If you're not familiar, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, a helpful way just to make sure again, we're varying. Cause I think our default mode in prayer is just to be selfish, right? Lord, help me in whatever whatever the present crisis may be. And if we think through Acts, okay, wait a minute. I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray and just praise God for who he is. Or I'm going to confess. I'm going to give him thanks. And then finally, at the S, we're going to supplication. We're going to ask for, ask for things. And then he talks about distraction. 
and just talks about how much with media and this book's already a little bit dated, but just how distracted we are as a culture and the fact that this requires work. And he has a pretty convicting couple of paragraphs that if we really took stock of our lives, uh, you know, we have the time. That's the issue. I'm doing my doctorate. And last year, my first seminar, one of their assignments is they made us log what we did every 15 minutes for 30 days, which is a real, really an irritating assignment. But man, it was actually helpful just to see how much, uh, how much time we have in a day. And so if we have the time, we have the time. That's the issue. Is it a priority? I think it was John Piper said something like, if nothing else, social media will show us how much time we had to pray <laughs> on judgment day. If no other purpose, it will show us that we did have the time. All right, so that's prayer. Um, let's move on to chapter six. The L and closer, learn, mining for gold. It's got that quote there on 85. Ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And as we talk, let me, in case I don't mention this, uh, one of the other benefits of praying the word, and we'll talk about meditation next week, but one of the benefits of praying the word is, is you have this kind of blending, the interweaving of word and prayer, right? Which is, is what? It's basically meditation. So we're praying the word, we're also reading the word, yet we're responding to God. And there's this beautiful just interweaving of word and prayer, which I think is the way it was supposed to be. So this chapter focused on the word and really gave us some tools on application. He talks about the fact that the spirit works the word for us at Southside. I mean, this is, this is foundational. We believe God, the spirit works primarily through his word. And so we want, we, we are a church founded on God's word. And he talks about a little bit about hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation. Gives us a little bit of tools. I think it's helpful as believers just think about, make sure we're reading the Bible rightly. By the way, um, this little bitty book, I'm pretty sure this is on our website, but it's called Asking the Right Questions. It's my favorite. I don't think he uses the term hermeneutics anywhere in here, but that's what it is. Uh, helping us interpret and apply the Bible. Very short, really, 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 really well written. There's a chapter in here on the, basically a summary of the story of scripture. It's like 12 pages long. It's the best summary of scripture I've ever seen in my life. Uh, so anyway, just a book plug real quick for that. Since we're not meeting together, I can't give it away. Sorry. Um, so the science of interpretation. And he uses the kind of classic observation, explanation, application. And it's important to get scripture right, you know, and there's, there's, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of misuses of scripture. He talks about the fact that scripture has one interpretation. So oftentimes in small groups, what will we hear with the language of, well, to me, it meant, and fill in the blank. Well, there are many applications, but God's word has one meaning. And that meaning is whatever the spirit through the author intended. And so as we read the Bible, that's what we're after first and foremost is what did the author intend? And so that's where some of these tools are helpful. That's what we're trying to get at. What did the author intend by what he wrote? And the, the rule of interpretation is the same as the rule of real estate. Location, location, location. Context, context, context. He talks about that on page 89. If you look at that first full paragraph, the primary key to understanding the writer's intended meaning of a text is identifying its context. Simply define the context of a statement, verse, or passage as the setting in which it is spoken or written. When it comes to interpreting and applying the Bible, context is crucial. In fact, we would go so far as to say the most important principle of biblical interpretation is that context determines meaning. So that's, that's really important. That's how we get at what the author intended. And we've just got to, we've got to realize that this whole idea, and some of you have been, y'all have been exposed to this. If you go to a lot of colleges, the, the literature department is so thoroughly postmodern that you have all kinds of other hermeneutics, reader response or whatever we bring. And really an, an, an objective truth has been jettisoned in our culture in academia because we're postmodern, we're relativistic. And as Christians, we just throw all that out, out the window. There is absolute truth. We can, by the Spirit, get to it 
and the author's meaning is what we're after. Context is so important. This is where we've got to be weary of word studies. I'm actually not a big fan of word studies. You probably can see that in my preaching. It's rare that I'm going to bring out, you know, various word studies because at the end of the day, meaning doesn't come from, from words. Meaning comes from sentences. This is true in all of literature. And sentences are embedded in paragraphs. Just to give one example, someone give us a definition of the word bear. A large furry creature. <laughs> a large furry creature, okay. When I came to the curve, I bared right. Or bare right at the curve. That doesn't fit a large furry creature, right? What's another, what's another definition of bear? Without covering. Yeah. Different spelling, sorry, B-E-A-R, that bear. That bear. Stand up under the weight of something. Say that again, David? To stand up under the weight of something. Okay, so bear right at the curve. Stand up under the weight at the curve. Could. Or bear with me. How would we define bear with the sentence bear with me a little longer? To, to hold or sustain yourself or sustain something of that nature? So we've just, that's four. There's probably more. But there's four pretty different definitions of the word bear depending on the context, right? And we could do that sort of thing with all kinds of words. And so, you know, when you hear, and there are certain Bible teachers, <clears throat> Beth Moore, not to name any, that, uh, that make a big deal out of word studies. And my rule is when you hear word studies, be leery. Uh, because often word studies can be abused in, in a lot of ways. Because words get their definitions from sentences. Uh, so context, context. And the other thing with that is there's different authors in scripture, because right, we have two authors, ultimately divine author and a human author and different human authors in scripture can use words differently. Anybody know any of any examples of that? That's, a, that's kind of a tough question. Uh, one of the Old Testament prophets wrote to give us a heart of flesh the apostle paul constantly talks about you know denying the flesh and you know crucifying the flesh so you have the word flesh used in two totally different ways yeah that's a great example yeah do james and paul use justification differently yeah that's a great example james 2 versus the way Paul uses it. And a similar word, uh, righteousness, is used by Paul to mean a standing, like a legal standing, but Matthew uses it to talk about our character. It's really important you get those two right. Or calling is a good example. So call in Paul is, is God's effective summons, but call in Matthew is just an invitation not not a an effective summons same verb so context and even authors and when we talk about context and he mentions this in the book in fact let me read uh, top of page 90 every verse of the bible is connected to the verses around it the book in which it appears the testament in which it is set and the message of the entire bible so a lot of a lot of like hermeneutics books will talk about the three horizons of context. You've got your immediate context right there in the in the sentence and in the paragraph, and then you've got your broader context, whether that be the whole letter or that author or the testament. And of course, the ultimate context of any verse is always the whole Bible. So when we're looking at if we did want to try to define a word, for example, let's say justification, we would start with the sentence. Then we look at the paragraph, then we look at the book, and then we look at all that Paul has written. Because again, Paul may use a certain word differently than Matthew or James or John. So we kind of start, start close with context and work our way out. 
on page 91, he kind of unpacks what observation means. And observation, again, O-E-A, observation, explanation, application. This is kind of your classic uh, inductive Bible study type method. Oh, sometimes it's O-I-A, observation, interpretation, application. But he, for observation, we ask these questions. He's got this list on 91. Who is the author? Who are the recipients? Who are the main characters involved in the text? What's happening in the text? What's the author intended to communicate? What are the key words in the text? What's the context of this verse? What important comparisons or contrasts do you see? When do the events take place? Where do the events take place? Why do the events take place? Why was this text written? How do these events occur? So we're really just interrogating the text. We could just ask who, when, what, why, jotting down observations. And then explanation, what does the text mean? And the question's there, what do the key terms mean? How do the verses or phrases relate? This is on the top of 93. How do the verses or phrases relate to each other? How does this passage fit into the larger story of the book it's in? How does this passage relate to the story of the Bible as a whole? How does this passage point to or speak of Jesus Christ? What are the differences between the biblical audiences and me? So trying to get at the meaning. And then, of course, application. Another way of saying it, what does it mean? What does it mean to me? Or what does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? An application, is there an application already in the text? And so we're in Romans 12 right now, and man, it's right there for us. But in Romans 1 to 11, there wasn't a lot of clear application right in the text, right? Except for this is what God has done. But now we're very heavy, so it's real easy to apply Romans 12 and following because it's in the text. Bottom of page 94, is there a command or exhortation for how we should live? What does this biblical principle mean today? What would the application of this verse look like in my life? What difference does this make in my life? How can this biblical principle help me in my walk with God? So observation, explanation, application. Uh, we'll talk about the one he gives, but let me just ask, you know of any verses that are um, consistently misused, yanked out of context? He mentions one, but the one I think about so much is when Matthew 18 to 28, where it's when two or three are gathered together in his name and people don't realize the context that was written for. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I'm there. The Lord is there with us when two or three are gathered. But in context of 18, 15 to 20, that's a church discipline yeah. passage. <laughs> so it's usually not what people think. Any others? They tend to be our coffee cup verses. I don't want to ruin anybody's verses for them. But any other examples that you see regularly misused? I can do all things through Christ. <laughs> there you go. Tim Tebow. <laughs> Athletes love, he mentions that. Athletes love that verse. It's like, I can do, I can do anything. I can dunk a 10-foot goal, even though I'm 5'5", five five, through Christ who strengthens me. We'll talk more about that one in a minute. What, any others? The one about the, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And yeah. That's good. Yeah. Jeremiah 29. And the context is exile in Babylon. Yeah. All things work together for good. Yeah. And they just stop there. Right. Yeah. That's good. Judge not. Judge not. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great one. Matthew 7 1. But then right after verse one, he talks about the fact that we are to judge. We just judge ourselves first. When I was in college, I was on the board of a, of a missions group. I won't name them because they, they do good work. But for the board meeting, we went up to the Metroplex and uh, the conference planning was going to be Habakkuk 1.5. And I don't remember the wording exactly, but it says something like, it's God saying, I'm, gonna, I'm about to do for you something that you'll never forget kind of language. And they use a paraphrase. So it was kind of like, 
you know, you're about to see something amazing kind of verse. The problem is he's talking about how he's about to destroy the Israel's, Israel's enemies. It's a judgment verse, not a God's going to work in amazing ways missions verse. Uh, Galatians 6, 17 is a very common tattoo verse. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. <laughs> it's not talking about ink. It's talking about, you know, suffering, persecution. And we could go on and on. There's lots. There's lots that we ink out. And again, there's oftentimes true principles uh, in these verses. So we don't want to throw, we don't want to become Nazis or Pharisees, but we do want to be careful on how we handle God's word and certainly not to apply it to ways that wasn't meant to be applied. So Philippians 4, Robbie does some good work on it to show, let's get to what Paul meant. What did Paul mean when he wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? And again, all you got to do is read a few verses before. That's really all you have to do in most cases, read a few to be content in any circumstance that's he's suffered he, he's he's lacking can you hear me got some warning the internet was messing up um so the point is i can then be content in all circumstances through christ who strengthens me so it's really not a big like victory verse it's kind of the opposite is when i have nothing i can do it i'm, I'm content whether i have plenty or whether i'm lacking i can do this and then the NIV came out in uh, 84, and then it was revised in 2011. It's, uh, it's got some problems in the new, the new version, but they nail this verse. Because in the Greek, the word uh, things is actually not there. So if you were just to translate it kind of rigidly, it would say, I can do all, or excuse me, I can do, yeah, I can do all through Christ who strengthens me. So there's no things there. We add that just for clarity of understanding. And the NIV doesn't add things, they add the word this. So the, trend, the verse is, I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. And we read that and we ask, well, what's the this? It's not all things, it's all this. What's the this? We read Philippians 4, 10 to 12, and we see that this is being content. So good example of context being important. Flip over to James chapter 1. As we talk about Bible study, you know, it's one thing to get the authorial intent. What does it mean? But that's not enough. And so James 1 helps us. The end goal is not, not ever merely understanding when it comes to God's word. James 1, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. So we don't want to just hear, we want to obey. And that'll be the whole focus of the next, uh, the next chapter, obedience. And that's, that's chapters uh, five and six in a nutshell. Lest you haven't heard me make my plug, let me do it. Um, if, you're, if you do not own this in your library, you need to. This is the single most helpful volume that you can have to help you understand and apply the Bible. The ESV study Bible. Um, it's just really well done. There's a lot of study Bibles out there. This is the best. And the main reason is they've got so many different contributors to do it. It's not just one group. It's not one team. Say for Romans, they picked one of the best commentators on Romans. For Acts, they picked one of the best evangelical commentators on Acts. So very much worth the price. I think the hard copy is something like uh, 25 bucks. If you don't have one and want one, I have some here. Let me know and I'll make sure you get a copy. Um, I've got a big one and I've got a smaller personal size. So, any closing comments? Hey, there we go. Tom representing. Don't drop it. The thing will break your foot if you drop it. Any final closing comments, uh, testimony, questions before we, before we wrap up?
Um, I just wanted to say that uh, kind of that learning how to pray was very, very helpful to me. Um, you know, being raised Catholic, all of our prayers were canned. Um, and so you didn't really have to think about them at all. And so learning how to pray is something that's very, very important, but I had no idea where to begin. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of different people pray, but having it, you know, kind of in writing, something I can refer to <laughs> helps it become a practice. Yeah. That's good. The only comment I would make about prayer is that um, it's great when you do pray and you pray for a year or two and you see the results, that's, that's very encouraging. But I have a few people in my life that are not saved, some, one of whom I've been praying for for more than 40 years and I'll probably continue to pray until I can't anymore. And, uh, you know, it, just because it, just because the timing you want isn't God's timing doesn't mean it's not effective and you shouldn't do it. Amen. Yep. Persist. I will uh, speak on behalf of Sharonda. Um, I know she's probably in the room putting Nathaniel down, but um, we have been consistently, and I know her even more than myself, praying for her sister. Her sister's name is Brandy. And um, Brandy has been a uh, pretty uh, adamant atheist for a long time and very outspoken. She would listen to us share with her uh, year after year, and every time we would get together, and um, she even uh, was even trying to get us uh, into reading some material that would draw us away from the faith. And um, she said, "If you read my book, I'll read some of yours." And so, but we've been praying her for 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 uh, for many many years, and um, she went through yet another very traumatic time in her life, and. Um, including having um, a, a young child just now uh, within the last uh, two months. And, um, but through that experience, through coming off of a very hard time in her life, she has accepted Christ. And um, I just praise the Lord for uh, how the Lord is using her right now. She is a total different person and uh, on fire for the Lord. And and we are just so thankful for the Lord to uh, answer that prayer. Uh, anytime that we meet with her, we just rejoice with her as being our new sister in Christ. And um, it's just, it is a beautiful thing to see how the Lord can use someone and, um, and even encourage us through answering our prayers. Amen. That's awesome. Well, I think about Tex Jackson and, she, her husband was not a believer and she prayed for him for over 50 years and he um, wasn't in the greatest of health and he actually came to church for a, a few Sundays in a row. Um, she would always pray for him and encourage him and share with him what she learned and um, but she never nagged him. And so he, um, he accepted Christ and within a month he was dead. Mm. So that was just this, she's got the sweetest testimony. If any of y'all haven't heard it, you should ask her about it. It's great. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, well, we've got a couple more weeks. We will do seven and eight next week, and then nine and 10, and, and be wrapped up. It's great to see y'all. Let me uh, pray, and we'll be done. Father, we're thankful for your invitation to us to relate with you. Thank you that you've given us the means we've need, we need. We have your spirit. We have your word, and I pray that we would prioritize them, that we would be increasingly a people of prayer and a people of your word, the Lord, that we would commune, commune with you at set times, but also just all throughout the day. Would you, by your spirit, prompt us regularly, Lord, if it goes, if we go 
45 minutes without thinking of you, would your, by your spirit, would you prompt us to think about you and to pray to you and just be in constant communion with you? Thank you for this invitation to joy. And we pray that we would seek to grow as believers in these areas. And as we get into D groups, that we would help others, give us favor to help others become better readers of your word and, and better prayers. That's what we desire. Continue to give us wisdom, Lord, as we as we navigate this pandemic, and especially as the, we begin to open, give us wisdom on how best to do that as a church and uh, as a city. I pray that you'd spare us, and Lord, may we have uh, opportunities to witness to your goodness and your glory. Bless our night in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, one last thing before we go. Uh, there are suggested scripture memory. Now we're doing two chapters a week, so that's kind of challenging. But let me encourage you, we'll talk more a whole chapter about this. But if you're not reading scripture, this is a great way to do it. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 would be a great one to, to chew on all week. And uh, we'll say more next week or the next week. I can't remember, but we'll have a whole chapter on it. So get started. All right. Have a good night. Good to see you.